Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so this afternoon, I will be... Are my slides up? There we go. Yeah, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about a really niche topic, which is regulating the use of distributed ledger technology in the gaming industry. So gaming, gambling, uh, we call the industry the gaming industry, and this covers um, basically the production of uh, gambling products and services. This covers everything from sports betting to casino games, such as slots, poker, blackjack, roulette, uh, all the way to bingos and lotteries. So the application of blockchain, the potential there is, is super wide. Um, so firstly, I'll go over the, the regulatory environment globally. Um, every jurisdiction approaches it differently. We can split it down into three different approaches. Um, one of them being complete prohibition. So this is often done in um, places where the popular approach is very anti-gambling. And while this is, uh, it looks good and it seems good, really it just pushes players towards the unregulated markets and it benefits the black market operators. This leaves players unprotected and enables fraud, uh, money laundering, etc. But the, the real problem is that those most vulnerable to problem gambling are left vulnerable by um, entering the black markets where the operators don't care about them. There's also non-comprehensive uh, regulations. Um, these are jurisdictions where they do have regulations in place. However, their, um, their checks and balances aren't quite as robust as they should be. And while there's plenty of good actors in these spaces, bad actors slip through the cracks and players are still left vulnerable. We see a lot of um, the big crypto gambling sites operating in, under these jurisdictions. Um, some of them good, uh, some of them not so good. But uh, we need to make sure we keep, um, we, don't, we don't confuse these jurisdictions with the more comprehensive regulations. We consider us, ourselves to be part of the um, comprehensive, the more comprehensive framework area. Um, we've built up our regulations over more than 20 years and have 400 active, active licensees. So the MGA is supported by the Gaming Act, which is um, backed up by our regulations and directives. Um, we have specific uh, frameworks in place and we have 20 years building up our, our checks. Our, all our 400 licensees have players that trust them. And while gaming companies only require to have an MGA license if they're operating to or from Malta, um, a lot of the larger operators will choose to hold a Maltese license because it, it, in, the, in the online gaming sphere, players trust the MGA seal of approval and also stakeholders, so financial institutions, uh, payment providers and banking. And if you want to have your company be legitimate in the, um, outside, of, outside of the industry itself, then you need a licensee that you can stand behind. When it came to regulating blockchain in the gaming industry, um, of course, there is a lot of um, potential there and we always want to welcome new innovative technologies in the industry. However, we needed to tread carefully, of course, as there's definitely challenges. And just because we're welcoming an innovative technology doesn't mean we can lower our standards when it comes to how we regulate um, gaming. Thankfully, in Malta, we had some foundations already in place from other regulatory stakeholders. These included the Malta Financial Services Authority with their VFA Act. So back in 2018, they published their VFA Act, which covered the distribution and exchange of um, virtual financial assets and DLT assets. Along with this, they licensed um, VFA service providers, who we also, we also have our, our um, licensed companies using these service providers. There's also the FAIU and their implement procedures cover blockchain and DLT asset specific checks. So the FAIU cover everything AML based in Malta. Um, and as subject persons, our gaming operators and also the service providers who are licensed by the MFSA all need to follow these implement procedures. And then there's the MDIA who cover the DLT infrastructure side of things. So they have their ITAS Act which has uh, checks um, for, the, for auditors who are auditing blockchain and smart contracts and other DLT infrastructure. They also certify auditing firms who are looking at blockchain um, infrastructure. So our policy itself, we can split it into two different sections, DLT payments and also DLT infrastructure. 
Firstly, I'll go through how we see DLT payments being used in, in gaming. Um, we focus on two different asset types, the first being uh, VFAs. They are your cryptocurrencies such as from Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT, all these cryptocurrencies. They can be a medium of exchange uh, inside and outside a DLT platform. So they can be used to buy goods and services anywhere. And then virtual tokens, and these are confined within a specific DLT platform. So these are definitions from the MFSA, not from us, the Malta Financial Services Authority. Um, virtual tokens, so they cannot be exchanged outside of the gaming platform. The gaming company can, have, can sell them to their players, but only on a fixed exchange rate and they can't, the players are not able to take them out of the platform. We see these potentially being used in play to earn games, uh, potentially they're won alongside other winnings and they can be spent on cosmetic items within the game or to game ac gain access to other uh, slot games, etc. And also maybe used in promotions. The things that we look at mostly when we are looking at applications to use virtual tokens are um, the security of the system, but also from a responsible gaming perspective just to make sure that they're not using these just to basically have their players um, disconnect the value of what they're playing with. Then there's VFA payments. So this is using cryptocurrencies. The real way we've seen these being implemented so far by our operators is what's on screen now. This is the flow of it. So we have all these existing gaming companies who have their system set up to accept fiat currencies and deal with fiat currencies but they have players who want to spend their Bitcoin, et cetera, on, on the gaming platform. Since they can't do exchange themselves, um, because they're not licensed by the MFSA, they can um, get an API from one of the MFSA licensed service providers in Malta. Um, they can have their API in, the, in their gaming platform. The player comes on, they say, I want to deposit 100 euros worth of Bitcoin. They get their, um, their, RD, their um, QR code and they scan it and they send their 100 euros worth of Bitcoin and it's exchanged into fiat by the service provider and it arrives in the gaming company as fiat. Um, this is also possible the other way around um, as we also accept um, casinos who want to accept crypto directly. Um, we have one of them, I'll get to it quite soon. And if, say, one of those crypto casinos wants to accept players that want to play with fiat, they can, of course, engage one of the service providers to do the exchange. But one of the main issues we came across when we started uh, onboarding licensee licensees with this approach was what if a player uses Wallet A in this, in this example, okay? So they use Wallet A to deposit, um, they deposit money using Bitcoin. And then they say, a few months later, after wagering the funds, they say, oh, I want to deposit, I want to withdraw, and I'm going to withdraw to this new wallet, Wallet B, because I lost, I lost access to Wallet A. We, um, in, in general, we would be able to contact the bank and make sure that they're actually the owner of the new account, of the new address, and, do, and perform all of these checks. Sometimes in crypto, it's quite a lot different. We highlight in the policy that the authorized persons, being the licensees, may refuse to effect withdrawals solely in light of AML concerns, and also that they need to forewarn players of the potential, the potential damage that it could do if they lose their wallet. However, we're not saying that it's not possible to withdraw the funds again. Um, they just must submit procedures to us, um, how they need to contact customer support, customer support, then pass it on to another team who deal with it on a risk-based approach to see is the other player, is the other wallet actually owned by that player. If it's a private wallet, this could be done potentially with a deposit. They could send a one euro deposit from wallet B to the gaming system saying, look, I, I'm able to send this. As under the implement procedures from the FAU, our um, AML um, body, they say that they just need to prove control of the wallet. And if it's a custodial wallet, then a lot, if you want a custodial wallet, if you say, this is my custodial wallet B, it's not really worth, it's not, it doesn't help if they send money across as the money will be coming from a wallet that is used by thousands of people. So they can't just send funds back and screenshots don't show much information. So that's where communication with these custodial wallet providers is really key. When it comes to casino operators who are accepting VFA directly, then we need to ensure that they don't lose control of the funds entirely. Um, 
and we do lay out this in the policy. We say that they need to inform us as how the flow, how the funds are going to flow between the wallets. So this is one of the examples. In this example, the operators to have a large wallet for each VFA that they're accepting. Uh, you see there's two VFAs displayed on screen and there's two different customers each depositing this VFA. All of the one VFA goes into VFA A goes into the VFA A wallet inside the operator and then the operator distributes the funds virtually. So because um, for responsible gaming reasons and um, other reasons there are deposit limits set in gaming situations. So. Um, I would set a deposit limit of 2,000 euros a month. I don't want to spend more than 2,000 euros a month on my casino account. If I go and try to deposit 100,000 euros worth of Bitcoin, then this needs to be stopped. And by setting up in a way like this, they cannot allow the funds to be sent to the playable balance and they can revert the funds back to the player or else which withhold the funds, inform us as the regulator, and we can inform them how to get the funds back to the player. This is another example. It's very similar, except the players are given their own wallet for each VFA inside the operating system, or the gaming system, but it still needs to go through the deposit checking limits. On to the use of DLT infrastructure in the gaming system. So there's a lot of different ways that uh, DLT can be used in the gaming systems from holding transaction data on the blockchain all the way to using smart contracts for wagering. In any scenario, like any other technical setup, we require it to go under a system audit as part of our licensing process. In the case of DLT setups, they will undergo specific DLT checks as laid out in the MDIA, uh, their, their ITAS Act, another Maltese government uh, authority and they also need to be carried out by auditors who have been certified by the MDIA. Then, so on to smart contracts. It's a very suitable um, application for gaming, as you could have two players who want to bet on a match, they put it into the smart contract, and when the results happen, it feeds into the smart contract, and the smart contract automatically pay, pays out the person who won. Players like this idea is they don't need to trust a casino, they don't need to trust that their funds are going to be, um, that they're going to touch their funds and they can just trust the smart contract. And while this is understandable, we're, our jobs is to create trust. As a regulator, we need to ensure trust. And so if we give up all control of the funds, and it could be an underage player who slips through the cracks and is able to play their funds through a smart contract, we need to make sure the operators are still, are still responsible for that. So we can't allow the free use of, of smart contracts in their purest form. So we do say that it must be possible to revoke outcomes in case of a flaw, and if not possible, then the authorised person must compensate any loss incurred by players, say if the result was fed wrong into the smart contract. And also self-exclusion, player limits and other obligations must be adhered to. So it doesn't just bypass our existing requirements just because they're choosing to use DLT. So what are the critical solutions here? I think all the way from uh, blockchain analytics is one thing. Uh, that, I suppose, improves with the more people using it, the better it gets, the more effective it gets, the better it gets at uh, investigations and ensuring that one wallet uh, is owned by a specific person. If there is blockchain analytic data there, it's much easier to prove it and also for AML investigations. Also on-chain KYC is something that holds great potential. But more than anything else, collaboration between different parties. Hopefully, um, at the moment, we have our frameworks in place in Malta. They're local and they're great. But until there's a larger scale um, cooperation in, by other regulators, then it's, it's hard to do investigations successfully and actually get data of who owns what, where funds are flowing. So hopefully with MICA, there will be moves towards um, uh, a large range of different providers and different stakeholders in the industry that can, can provide trust and provide data. And that's why we need to maintain our reputation so we can be part of that, that ecosystem. And when it comes to all the well-regulated exchanges, they will actually share money, or share, they will share information with our licensees because they know that the licensees of the Multi Gaming Authority can be trusted and they operate, operate in a um, player-friendly uh, manner. 
If you have any questions, please reach out to my email on screen, even if you want to critique the way we're approaching this, and also look at our policy on mga.org.mt. Thank you very much.